Thank you, Jim. It's, uh, it's great to be back here at this conference. This is, I don't know how many years we've been doing this, Andy, but it seems to get better every single year, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure working with you and your staff in doing this. Um, this is a finance conference, and it's hard to think about investments and finance without some sort of geopolitical framework in which to think about things. And um, I've been in the markets, I've been with Goldman Sachs now, it'll be 30 years in July. And I can, I'm old enough to remember when geopolitics seemed to matter. And things happened around the world and markets reacted and, and, and things happened. And it seems that markets are more immune to that these days. And I think that the things that are happening around the world today have more consequences than ever. But somehow, while geopolitical volatility seems to be at a high, implied and realized volatility in the market seems to be at a low. And I can't think of many people in the world more qualified to help us think about this and set a framework around geopolitical events than our next speaker. And I'm thrilled to introduce Nick Burns, one of Boston College's most accomplished alums. And I'm not a huge fan of reading long biographies, but I think I have to do it in this case because uh, it's so impressive. A lot of it's in your pamphlet. I won't read all of it, but you know, the topic of, uh, of the, his comments today, as you'll see in the program, is foreign policy challenges for the Trump administration. Nick, I don't know where you're going to get any material for your, uh, for your <laughs> comments today. But Nick has spent 27 years in, uh, in government service. And he, is, he was, most recently, he was a member of, the sec of Secretary of State John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Policy Board at the Department of State. That was from 2014 to 2017. Um, before that, he was the Under Secretary of, State, Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008, the State Department's third highest ranking official. He was ambassador to NATO, ambassador to Greece, State Department spokesman from 95 to 97. We all see what a difficult job that can be. He worked for five years on the National Security Council at the White House, where he was senior director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs, and special, pre special assistant to President Clinton and director for Soviet affairs in the administration of George H.W. Bush. So when you think about that background, you think about the accomplishments, you think about everything he has done academically, the things he does in the, uh, in the nonprofit sector, we're just really delighted to have uh, Nick Burns join us again today. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always, for me, um, a real honor to come back to Boston College. I was an undergrad here, graduated with Dean Boynton in 1978. We were classmates, did not know each other well, have become very close friends since. And I'm a real admirer uh, of what he's done for the business school. This is one of the elite undergraduate and graduate programs of business in the United States. We're very proud of what Andy's done and will continue to do. Uh, for Boston College, and uh, I'm really pleased that all of you are here today. If this were Washington, D.C., there'd be nobody in the room. <laughs> They're giving out free drinks in the bars in Washington. It's, it's the city sport to watch uh, Jim Comey testify at 10 a.m., but we've all read his testimony, so we'll spare you that. But I have a very modest brief today. Andy's asked me to talk about um, Donald Trump's administration, the challenges the United States is facing in its foreign and national security, I want to do that relatively simply and just give you a couple of thoughts because we've got a little bit of time and I always find in sessions like this it's much more interesting for me to hear what's on your mind. And everyone's going to have a thought or a question. Please challenge me. Uh, if I say something you profoundly disagree with, I tell my students you have to talk back, you have to give constructive criticism. But I'll leave a lot of time for that discussion period because, because I think this is the most complex national security environment that the United States has faced probably since the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think the problems we face overseas, the challenges, as well as some of the opportunities are profoundly difficult for us. And we've got to focus on them and try to marshal the strength of the United States and of our allies and friends around the world to meet them. Um, I learned from the Jesuits at Boston College to be wary of hyperbole and exaggeration. So three caveats to the statement I just made. Because we do live in this self-obsessed social media time where people think that what's happening right now is the most challenging time in the history of the United States. It's not. 
It is the most complex time since 1945, I think in, overseas for us, but it's not nearly as challenging as the revolution. That was the most faithful time from an existential basis for the United States. It's not nearly as dangerous a time as the South's rebellion against the Union. I grew up here in the North in Wellesley, went to school here. It was not really a civil war. The South rebelled against the Union. And we consider Lincoln to be our greatest president because he preserved the Union and he abolished slavery and he liberated the African American population of the country. That was the most dangerous time when the country literally split. When I think statistically every family in the country lost someone. And the number of dead and wounded in that war over five years exceeds the dead and wounded in all of our other wars combined. That was the most dangerous time. The third caveat is to say that we live in a globalized time and America is the leading global power, but actually between 1942 and 1946, we had 16 million men and women in uniform. And they were dispersed throughout the war world in a two-front war in Asia, Pacific, and in Europe. So we were, in a way, even more engaged. And that was a pivotal global conflict. They were all those three more difficult than what we face now. We have to be a little bit humble as we look at the broad sweep of American history. But let me get to complexity for a minute. When President Trump goes into the Oval Office every morning, he faces the same kind of challenges that President Obama, obviously, and President George W. Bush faced going all the way back to 9-11 uh, and President Bush's inauguration in 2001. And the first basket of issues that they face are transnational, an academic term for problems that go under our borders, over our borders, and through our borders, like climate change like trafficking of men and women, uh, women and children, excuse me, which is a scourge in every continent in the world, like global crime cartels and drug cartels, the whole complex of cyber issues, from cyber espionage to cyber war, and the first, the next war, God forbid there'll be a global war, will likely begin in cyberspace as one adversary tries to knock out the, G the satellite, GPS satellites of the other to blind them in the first moments of a war. These are transnational problems which in a way are historic and transformational because for the first time in the history of the world every person living on earth is affected by them. We've never had a moment in human history where everyone's in the same boat. There are about 7.5 billion people in the world in 195 nation states. Every single person is affected by climate change. Every person is affected by the cyber age. Every person is affected by crime and drug cartels and by the threat of pandemics. Think, think of the progression of those pandemics from SARS to Ebola to Zika. So our modern presidents, and I worked in every administration from the Jimmy Carter administration to the George W. Bush administration. I was an advisor in the Obama administration. Every president has had to see as their first order responsibility, how does the United States lead in helping the world to confront these challenges? So it's a job that requires us to be outward looking and to use our extraordinary power, political, economic, and military, to be the global leader. And particularly in the last decade or so of my own career at the State Department, before that at the White House, a lot of the time of the two President Bushes, of President Clinton, President Obama since, has been to form these coalitions on each of the issues and we're usually at the center of them. We're either the chairman of the board or we're the lead director, we're at least on the committee because you can't fight climate change if the second leading carbon emitter, the United States, is not part of that solution. And you can't attack the human trafficking rings if the United States with its enormous intelligence capacity and judicial capacity and moral power in the world is not part of that coalition. That's how our presidents spend their time. I think President Trump is now getting used to the fact that he's not just looking out for the interests of the United States. We're at a time of global history where we have to look out for the interests of the entire world because of the interlocking nature of the world. It's a different job than Franklin Delano Roosevelt's job or Woodrow Wilson's job or Abraham Lincoln's job. And I wanted to start there because I don't think it's clearly understood in our national conversation. That's how the president spends most of his time. 
these days. And that complex of transnational challenges is really tough to get your arms around. It's tough to form coalitions. You know this, those of you who are in business. You form a group to do something. You've got to have a leader. You have to have a purpose. You have to have execution. You have to have clear-sighted view of what your horizon line is. It's really hard to work with the Chinese and the Europeans and Middle Eastern nations at the same time, but that's the job. I would also say in that inbox of President Trump, he's got to worry about a weakening Europe, a violent, turbulent, and destabilized Middle East, and this big competition that we have with China for who will be the predominant power in the 21st century. I think those are the three big issues. There are a thousand others, challenges and opportunities in the Americas, which I think are mainly positive for the United States. The Americas are increasingly market-focused and democratic-focused. Big challenges in Africa, but big opportunities. Six of the ten fastest-growing economies in the last decade worldwide have been at sub-Saharan African countries. Chinese investment, which is providing infrastructure that allows allow people to climb out of poverty and, 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 and create a future for the continent very different than we would have imagined even two or three decades ago. I'm not going to focus on those two in my remarks, but we can get to them in the conversation. But those three big issues are issues, Europe, Middle East, and Asia, that every president has struggled with. A word about each of them. In Europe, three data points, because we're so accustomed to think that Asia's the future, that Asia's vital. Well, it is in many ways, but Europe's our largest trade partner. The largest trade relationship in the world is the 500 million people of the European Union, the biggest single market in the world, and our economy of 320 million people. Europe's the largest investor into our economy. That's critical for us in terms of capital investment. And Europe has the largest number of American allies in the world. I was American ambassador to NATO. I arrived just before 9-11. I left after we had gone into both Iraq and Afghanistan in 2005. We can count on those countries. They have our back. The power differential between the United States and Russia globally is a function in large part of the fact that we have allies willing to fight with us, combine forces with us, stand up with us, and the Russians have zero allies in the world. And I always appreciated that when I sat around this table of sometimes disputatious friends from all these NATO countries. We argued every day, but in the final analysis, they were with us. And so in, we've got to appreciate how vital Europe is to the economic and military and political future of the United States. But Europe is in a tough spot because they've gone through these problems in the Eurozone, 2010, 11, and 12. Barely escaped the dissolution of the European Union, a, a Greek exit, which could have created a spiral of other countries exiting. We've seen declining support for the EU in some of these countries. We've seen the second largest economy and the strongest military decide to leave. And in 22 months, Britain, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland will be out. The consequences for Europe from, British, from Britain's departure is going to be quite challenging. Because Britain, because of its colonial past, imperial past, because of the Commonwealth presently, because of history, Britain's the most globally oriented of all the European countries. You can't really say that Germany is globally oriented, although it's powerful. It's a big economic engine. France is fated as a global power. Britain is not. And if you take Britain out of the EU, it becomes much more regionally focused, much less globally focused. And that's going to be a challenge for us and for the Europeans. Also for the British, elections today, I think the Conservatives will likely win. But when they leave the EU in 22 months, the Scottish National Party is likely to call for a referendum, another vote. And it's an even proposition at this point whether the Scots would vote to secede from the United Kingdom and join the EU as a five million strong country about the size of Denmark. I'm the grandson of two Irish immigrants. We have a tortured history with Britain, the Irish people, over 700 years. A lot of us know that history all too well. But I thought the Irish question was settled. When I was a student here at Boston College studying history, 
Jerry Adams and Sinn Féin are saying that maybe this is the time to unite Ireland, to bring Northern Ireland into a larger republic and to unite the island itself. Is it then possible, or at least perhaps probable, that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, put together in 1707 by the Act of Union, will be the United Kingdom of England and Wales ten years from now? So the consequences of Brexit are going to be interesting, important for markets, important for people like me who follow global politics. The Europeans are reeling from this. They're reeling from the influx of more than 1.5 million immigrants, largely from the Syrian civil war, but also from Iraq and Afghanistan, from Tunisia, from Libya, from Egypt and Algeria. This huge exodus of people from the Levant and North Africa because of war and deprivation and lack of economic opportunity. And that immigrant wave over the last two years has divided the Europeans. The East Europeans, the Czechs, the Poles, the Slovaks, the Slovenes, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, and the Balkan peoples have largely said, close their doors to these Muslim, mostly immigrants, because they conceive of themselves as Christian societies. They don't want to be open to have a multi-religious, multi-ethnic future. And that's been a big problem for the EU because the Western countries, France and Germany and Sweden and Finland and the Netherlands, have been quite open to immigration because they are largely becoming a lot like the United States. We are multi-ethnic and multi-religious to the core in this country. And to see the two halves of Europe split has been a weakening, has been very much weakening for the European Union. Beyond that, the rise of right-wing populism to see Marine Le Pen become a serious contender for the French presidency. Geert Wilders, who's a fascist, still singularly the most important politician in the Netherlands. He lost the elections. He's a strong party. To see a fascist government, and I use that word specifically in advisory in, in Hungary, a far-right government in Poland, and even alternative for Deutschland is not going to win the German elections. Far from it. But they might be represented in the Bundestag a far-right party for the first time in seven decades of German history. The Democrats have defeated the populace in 2017. It started in the Netherlands. Macron's extraordinary victory was so important for the future of a democratic Europe. And I think it's reasonable to think that Chancellor Merkel's party, the CDU, has a very good chance of returning to power in a coalition after the September 24th German elections. But the battle is not over. The right-wing populace, and they are anti-democratic, they're anti-immigrant, they're anti-Muslim. They do not believe what we believe or what most Europeans believe about democracy. They will be back. They will contest for power. And it's the most divisive time in European history since the 1930s when similar, in some cases, anti-democratic fascist parties, of course, took over Germany and Italy and other European countries. And if you put all that together, and then you add Vladimir Putin to the mix, what's he been doing? Well, he invaded Georgia in 2008 and divided the country into three parts. He's kept Moldova just to the west of the Russian Federation divided. He invaded Crimea in March 2014 and then annexed it, annexed it, stole it, took it by an act of the Russian Duma. No European leader had done that since the Second World War and then put 8,000 troops into the Donbass, the industrial heartland of Ukraine, and has separated that part of Ukraine and held it really for Russia and ethnic Russian militants in contravention of the most sacred international laws. You don't have a right to cross someone's border and take the territory because you want to do it, because you've got some excuse that you want to do it. So on a north-south line, Putin is redividing Europe. One of the crowning achievements of the United States, and I worked for President George H.W. Bush as a Soviet advisor at the end of the Cold War in the White House. The Cold War ended peacefully without a shot being fired. Europe unified, whole, free, and at peace in the words of George H.W. Bush. And now we have not the Cold War coming back, but a divided Europe because the Russians are seeking strategic depth. Putin is. That's what Stalin wanted. It's what the Romanovs wanted. They want to essentially have effective control 
over their countries to the south and west. They want some kind of barrier. It's a very 18th, 19th century way of thinking about security in a globalized environment. They want a barrier between Russia and Germany, Russia and Poland, Russia and NATO. <coughs> Big challenges in Europe. We should talk about them. My bumper sticker, my basic assessment is that Europe's going to survive this. The EU will survive. NATO is certainly going to survive. The Democrats are, have struck back against the anti-democratic populace, but the jury is out. And if it's, if, it's, if it's the place where it's our largest investor, largest trade partner, largest number of allies, we've got to be focused and be a good friend to Europe and reach out to them and solidify our alliance. In the Middle East, we could have a course here at BC that went on for five years and didn't get even to the heart of what's going on. So just a couple of headline comments. Um, remember the Arab Spring? January, February, March of 2011? I had lived as a diplomat in Mauritania, West Africa, an Arab country, in Egypt, and I lived and worked in East Jerusalem uh, and the West Bank um, as a young diplomat in the 1980s. So I knew the, I know the Middle East fairly well. And I was optimistic that those largely peaceful student-led protests of January, February, March 2011 might lead to some change because these people weren't really calling for absolute revolution. They were calling for jobs. They were calling for an opportunity society that looked like ours. Um, the youth bulge, the demographic bulge, is really awesome to think about in the Middle East. These are societies sometimes with 60, 70 percent of their population below the 30 and no jobs and a lot of corruption and crony capitalism, and no rules, no law-abiding society to give them a framework to live their lives. That's what they wanted. What's the report card six and a half years later? Of the 22 Arab countries, everybody is worse off now than they were in January 2011, with a possible exception of Tunisia, which has a hybrid Muslim democratic government, Morocco, where the king has devolved some powers very skillfully to the parliament. But Egypt's worst off. It's the Keystone State, the largest country, the lead cultural and historical force. It's poised for another revolution. And there are four failed states, Libya and North Africa. There is no central government controlling the country. There's no law and order. They can't defend their external borders. They can't police their streets. There are five tribes. It's a tribal-based society, so not surprising, vying for power. The Russians have actually intervened on the ground with Russian forces to support one of them. The United States left and NATO after the ill-fated 2011 NATO intervention. So Libya is a failed state. Yemen's a failed state. We don't read enough about Yemen in our newspapers. Critical country at the base of the Arabian Peninsula, right? Neighbor to Saudi Arabia, now victim of a proxy war between the great Sunni power of Saudi Arabia and the great Shia power, Iran. Both sides funneling arms, tremendous number of civilian casualties, and a civil war that has no end in sight. Iraq is the third, third failed state. We know a lot about Iraq. We had 4,250 Americans die in Iraq between 2003 and 2011. We now have 6,000 troops back in the country after our departure in 2011. Iraq is permanently, I think, divided. 100 years after its creation, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, after the First World War, you have a Shia-dominated South in Baghdad and Basra, and it pains me to think that for all of the blood and treasure we spent, and we can discuss whether it was wise to go into Iraq in the first place, but we did go in. Iran is now the great power, not us, in Baghdad and Basra. The Kurds heading out the door. Largest ethnic group in the world without their own state. They live in five big countries of the Middle East, Iraq being one of them. The Kurds are autonomous. They have some oil. They're friendly with the United States. They're probably our most effective partner in that part of the world. I think they're heading out the door. And Iraq will be splintered. And then Anbar province, the Sunni, big Sunni province, still controlled largely by the Islamic State and have been since June of 2014 for the last three years. So Iraq's divided, and there's no end to sight in that civil war. And the fourth failed state is Syria. 
Its neighbors are Israel and Jordan and Iraq and Turkey and Lebanon. Keystone state, vital state. Pre-war population in 2011, 22.4 million people. 2017, 12 million of those 22.4 million people are homeless. 12 million homeless out of 22.4 million people. About 7 million of them homeless inside the country. They've been blasted out of their homes by the Russian and Syrian air forces, by the Islamic State, by Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda group. There are 40, 50 militia groups fighting. And if you're the wrong ethnicity, the wrong type of Muslim, if you're Sunni in a Shia area or Shia in a Sunni area, it's a fight to the death. If you don't flee, you'll likely be killed and your family with you. Seven million people trapped in the most vicious civil war and the greatest humanitarian crisis since 1945 anywhere in the world. Five million outside the country, refugees in Jordan, in Iraq, in Turkey, and in Lebanon. One of every two school children in Lebanon are Syrian refugee kids. And about a million point five have fled to Europe. In any previous refugee crisis, going back to 1945, the United States, as the wealthiest country in the world, as an immigrant society ourselves and a refugee society, has usually taken about half the refugees in every Republican and Democratic administrations. President Trump has said we will take no refugees, zero. It's the greatest humanitarian crisis since 1945, and we are literally AWOL from a humanitarian standpoint. So the Middle East has been fundamentally destabilized. And I think you have to say, if you're thinking of investment purposes or political stability purposes, or if one of your kids wants to study Arabic in the Middle East, I think it's reasonable to think that the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Kuwait and Oman are going to be relatively stable. They have survived the revolutions. The monarchies have survived better than the pseudo-dictatorships who want to be democracies. I think the Gulf will be stable for the next five to ten years. But the projections are that this schism in the Arab world, the creation of these terrorist groups, that the threat has metastasized. The Islamic State is going to be defeated in Mosul in the next several weeks. The invasion of Raqqa by Syrian Sunni and Kurdish forces backed up by the United States began Monday. And if we knock them out of these two centers of power, Raqqa in northern Syria and Mosul in Lebanon, in Iraq, excuse me, that'll be a significant achievement. But they've already metastasized. They've already set up shop in Somalia and Sudan, in Chad, in northeast Nigeria where they're aligned with Boko Haram. They're in Mali where 3,000 French troops are fighting them, supported by American air power. They, this Islamic terrorist threat has metastasized all the way across the Pan-Sahelian belt from East Africa to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and West Africa. And really smart people, much smarter than me, who look at this closely say, we're going to be fighting a low-grade terrorist war for the next 25 years. We won't have 100,000 troops, American troops, in any of these countries. We've learned the lessons, the bitter lessons from Iraq. But American special forces, American intelligence, American air power have to be deployed with the French and the Chadians and Nigerians, the Mauritanians, the Kenyans, the Sudanese. This is, these are historical forces happening. So I think, I think the Middle East is going to be highly destabilized for a long time to come. Leaves a third region that President Trump is focused on. I think he's done rather well to think about this big relationship with China. China's two things for us. It's going to be our most important partner, partner, not enemy, in many realms. If we're looking at global macroeconomic stability, the global economy, over the next 25 years, we're going to be the two largest economies, the two most important capital investors, the two most important providers of infrastructure and of economic leadership will be China and the United States. On climate change, we're the two largest emitters of carbon, so we have the responsibility and the self-interest to work together. On a lot of those transnational issues I talked about, China has capacity. If you've worked with the Chinese government, I have extensively, these are, these are impressive people. They're sophisticated. They're organized. 
They have a sense of what they want to accomplish in the world. Think of the huge ambitions of One Belt, One Road. I'll bet a lot of you who are in the investment community are focused on that right now. And what the Chinese are doing in Central Asia, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, the, the construction of vertical rail lines and vertical highways to link the big South Asian populations, India will soon be the biggest country in the world by population with Central Asia, is historic. This is a country of great ambitions and so we have to partner with China and understand them and work with them. I think President Trump was right to focus on Xi Jinping from the beginning, to invite him to Mar-a-Lago, to try to set up a relationship where we can work with them. But here's the problem that President Trump is going to face, the same problem President Obama and George W. Bush faced. China's our most important partner. It's also our most important competitor for military predominance in Asia because since the close of the Second World War, the Japanese surrendered to MacArthur, General MacArthur on September 2nd, 1945 on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Since that day, we've been the great military strategic power of Asia. We have American troops still, 30,000 troops in South Korea, 36 or 7,000 troops in Japan. We have American troops back in Australia, in Northern Australia, Darwin, which is where MacArthur started his comeback against the Japanese in 1942. We have new emerging security partnerships with Vietnam. Andy and I were 17 when the war ended. We were high school juniors, thinking about how we were going to get into BC. <laughs> and that's when the war ended. I couldn't have imagined on January 27, 1973, the day we decided to have the peace agreement with North Vietnam, that in 2017, the Vietnamese would be saying to us, we only thought, fought you for 13 years. We re resisted Chinese power for 1,000 years. Please send your Navy back to Cameron Bay. <laughs> Please be our military partner. It's the same message we're hearing from India. I worked a lot on India for President George W. Bush. Strategically, India is emerging as one of the great powers of the world, economically, demographically, militarily. India has more military exercises on the air and sea with the United States than any other country. It's buying its military technology from Israel and the United States. We're one, two in terms of sales of advanced military technology to India. It's emerging as a great power. And what unites Vietnam and India and Thailand and Japan and South Korea and Australia with the United States? Well, it's the relationships we've formed over 70 years. It's also fear of China. Because under Xi Jinping, the Chinese are pushing out they're pushing out into the South China Sea to contest the sovereignty of five other claimants to the Spratleys and Paris Hill Islands. And they're pushing out illegally by brute military force. They're contesting Japanese sovereignty in the East China Sea, inhabited Senkaku Islands just south of the Japanese home islands. But they're Japanese. Under the U.S.-Japan Defense Treaty, the United States has pledged to defend Japan against China should China attack. So here's the conundrum for President Trump, and it's really difficult. When have we ever had a relationship in American history with another great power where that power is our most important partner and our most important competitor? So how do we work with China and yet not be dominated by China? That balance is about as difficult a challenge as any we have faced in a century. And so if you've got a weakening Europe and a destabilized Middle East and you've got this supremely important challenge in China, boy, do we need good people in government and in the White House and the Pentagon and the State Department. And that brings me to my last point, and then we can have a good conversation. I've worked for Republicans and Democrats throughout my career. That's what civil servants do. When we take an oath, we don't take an oath to the Commander-in-Chief or the President or the Secretary of State. We put our hands in the Bible and take an oath to the Constitution. Every federal official does, military or civilian. And that's our rule-based society. So I've tried to be nonpartisan throughout my career, and I've tried to think about these challenges in a nonpartisan way because we need both parties, and we need both halves of red and blue America to be engaged 
in pursuing and defending against the challenges and pursuing the many positive opportunities we have. I think we have a leadership crisis here in the United States. And it's a profound crisis. I'm not talking so much about what Director Comey is going to say to the Senate Intelligence Committee. I'm talking about this whole idea of America first. To me, studying history, I was a history major here at Boston College. When I first heard it in 2015 from candidate Trump, I thought, what an ugly, ugly phrase. Because America first was Lindbergh. And it was the isolationist movement of 1938, 39, and 40 that basically said, we can be an island unto ourselves. And if the rest of the world is going to go up in flames, we don't have to join them. And we are friendly with Britain and France and the democracies of Western Europe, but we're not responsible for them. And if Lindbergh had won that fight, there is every reason to believe that the Second World War would have turned out to be a German, a Nazi victory. Because without the armed might of the American economy, and this was the critical factor, the awesome American economy of 42 to 45, the tanks, the planes, the material that allowed the Soviets to win on the Eastern Front and allowed Britain to survive. If we hadn't had Franklin Roosevelt, and if Lindbergh had his way, it would have been a disaster of epic proportions for this country. So to choose the phrase as the banner you choose to fly to lead this country in 2017 is historically objectionable. But then let's look at the ingredients to the policy. If America first means that we don't believe in free trade, that we don't have the confidence to think that the Americans, we've always been a trading nation, from the pilgrims in Plymouth Colony, from Salem, Massachusetts, and its Asia trade, all the way through to 2017, if we're really rejecting the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats, that if we lower barriers, tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers to trade, other countries and economies will succeed with us and markets will grow, then I don't know where we are in a globalized 21st century. The president came in and rejected the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's 20 per that's 40% of global GDP, the 12 members. It was designed to challenge China and India, the protectionist economies of Asia, to say that we have to be rules-based, you have to play by the rules, you can't be part China and India of this regime unless you adhere to the rules and stop ripping off American IPR, intellectual property, excuse me, and stop creating a situation where American companies can't compete fairly in the China market, to just give that up in your first week as president? Major tactical error. Now, I chalk that up to inexperience. Then the president said to Angela Merkel, we don't want a trade agreement with the European Union, but we'll have one with you, Germany. And Angela Merkel, in her first visit to the White House, had to explain to the president, the EU negotiates single trade agreements on behalf of all member states of the EU, and this has been the case for 25 years. But you see the administration coming back to this nationalism, this nationalist focus. We don't want to trade multilaterally. We want to trade with each country individually. We haven't thought like that in really since the 1930s. Roosevelt and Truman and Eisenhower, Reagan, the two Bushes, Clinton, we've all thought that we win if we create a free trade ethos in the world. And the president has even said that NAFTA is the worst trade agreement in the history of the world. One of the best trade agreements in the history of the world that has allowed the Mexicans and Canadians to form in the United States one of the largest single markets in the world, now the largest global energy power in the world, this virtuous union with our two great neighbors. If you begin to raise walls between Europe and the U.S., Mexico and the U.S., even Canada in the U.S. in 2017, it might have been logical in 1817, we were largely autarkic. We didn't depend on the rest of the world for trade, for services, for capital, for labor. But that's how our economy is constructed now. So I, I challenge, I'm not an economist. A lot of you will be smarter about these issues because you're in the marketplace. I'm not teaching college. But I challenge this notion that you can withdraw from a trading environment. I don't think it's going to work for the United States.
If that's what America first means in trade, we're going to fail. If America first means in alliances that we don't really need them anymore, look what happened in Brussels three weeks ago. The president walked into the dedication of a new NATO headquarters. We're the leader of the NATO alliance. These countries have had our backs since 1949. They all went into Afghanistan with us after 9-11. I was the ambassador there. We invoked Article 5. An attack on one is an attack on all on the morning of September 12, 2001. They all had our back. They said, we'll fight with you against bin Laden. They've all gone in. They've suffered more than 800 casualties. They're all still there. And the president goes in to dedicate a 9-11 memorial and the building and Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Mattis and General McMaster had written into the speech, the United States reaffirms under my leadership, President Trump, our commitment to the security of our allies, Article 5. You had our backs on 9-11, we have yours. And he failed to say the words. He failed to do it. We know now from enterprising reporting in Politico over the last five days that that phrase was actively taken out and instead what the Europeans got was a lecture about their defense spending. Now, I've lectured the Europeans about their defense spending, too. I spent three and a half years as the U.S. ambassador to NATO. But there's a time and place for everything. And in a solemn ceremony to dedicate a 9-11 memorial, you lecture the Europeans and then don't reaffirm your commitment? It's been a bad two weeks because following that, the president, I think the single greatest mistake of his presidency, then took us out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. It's a voluntary agreement. It's not a treaty. You could stay in the treaty, in the agreement, and then say, well, we're just, we're not going to meet our commitments or, but to withdraw the message to 7.2 or 3 billion people is climate change for you, the rest of the world might be the single biggest issue. It is in the politics of Europe, but we're not going to help. In fact, we're absenting ourselves. I think there was a single greatest blow to the credibility of the United States in the last 10 or 15 years, President Trump taking us out of climate change. And then over the weekend, in the immediate aftermath of a terrorist attack in London, and this is our greatest ally, the president takes to Twitter and he criticizes the mayor of London. Not once. He went back and did it twice the next day. We have a crisis of leadership. If America first means we're withdrawing from the global econ economic leadership, we're not paying attention to our allies. We're closing down immigration. I know Governor Bush talked to you about immigration. We're an immigrant society. If we went around this room and asked the Americans here, where are you from? And we don't mean like, where do you live now? But where did you come from? Your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, every one of us is an immigrant. Every one of us has that story. It's the unifying feature of American history. And for President Trump now to say, we're going to severely restrict immigration to this country, extreme vetting. We've taken in 800,000 refugees since 9-11. Not a single one of those people has engaged in a terrorist attack. We take in 70,000 immigrants a year. They're the lifeblood of our society. I see them at the Harvard Kennedy School where I teach. Andy sees them here at BC. Some of our best students who want to sit in the front row, who are to class early, where the education really means something for them because there's never been a person in their family to go to college, these are the future CEOs of America. They're the future secretaries of state of America. Madeleine Albright was a refugee. Henry Kissinger was a refugee. Albert Einstein was a ref refugee. I joined a friend of the court brief. I'm not a lawyer, but I joined a brief against the immigration and refugee ban. It's fundamentally discriminatory the way it's written towards Muslims. And we shouldn't have a religious means test of who gets in this country. If America first means no to trade, no to alliances, and we're shutting our doors to the rest of the world, we are marching briskly backwards towards another time in American history, an uglier time. We have a crisis of leadership in this country and a crisis of credibility when your president is a bull, literally, in a china shop when you don't even show elementary respect to Angela Merkel and to Emmanuel Macron, Democrats, but you show enormous respect and deference to autocrats, 
Saudi kings, Russian presidents, Chinese presidents. They deserve our respect, but we don't agree with what they stand for, largely. We certainly agree what Angela Merkel stands for, given her democratic leadership in Europe. I'm worried. I didn't come here to be a rabble rouser. I feel uncomfortable after a whole career in government on a nonpartisan basis, serving presidents of both parties. I feel uncomfortable. But you have to tell the truth as you perceive it. Last thought, one more minute. Forgive the length of this. Churchill came to Boston and Cambridge in September 1943, in the middle of the war. We had just turned the tide of the war. He had, and FDR had. It's after Midway, we observed the 75th anniversary of Midway this week, the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, the 73rd anniversary of D-Day, all this week. It's after Midway, it's after El Alamein, the great turning point in North Africa. It's after Stalingrad, the great turning point in the Eastern Front. We know we're gonna win the war. Churchill has his eye on the post-war environment. He went to Harvard and talked to a big ROT, ROTC class of young men, not women at those days, unfortunately, thousands of them at Harvard, training to be officers. And he had one message for them, and I've read the speech, it's a beautiful speech. He said, gentlemen, the price of greatness is responsibility. He could see in September 1943 that Britain was no longer the great power in the world. It was really the United States. It, the handoff came in 1942-43, there was no single date where FDR and the American people became the great force in the world, not Britain. And it was a peaceful handoff. And his advice was that you can't be a great country if you're not responsible to the rest of the world, to your, if you don't use your power to integrate, to heal, to unite, to bring people together. And if the policy is, we're gonna build walls, you can't come in, you're Muslim, you said something I didn't agree with, so I'm not going to even shake your hand, Angela Merkel in the Oval Office. I'm not going to reaffirm publicly my commitment to our greatest set of allies in the world. If that's the message, narrow, insular, an America withdrawing, this is not a message that the senior Republican Party leadership agrees with. You go down the issues I've just talked about, alliances, trade, Immigration and refugees, Mitch McConnell doesn't agree with it. Paul Ryan doesn't agree with it. John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, on issue by issue, will disagree with President Trump. We have a leadership crisis, and we need great leadership to be a great country. Thank you very much. So, um, fire back. <laughs> Tell me where I'm wrong. Questions, comments? First of all, I agree with everything you said. Second of all, <laughs> with regards to Syria, what, what do you think can be done with that active presence that you've trained that you need to be in terms of participating? So the, the question is Syria. What can be done? I would say if you're President Trump, and I have great sympathy for him on, these two, on this issue, Syria and North Korea are the two big foreign policy issues where there are no obvious answers. So I've got sympathy for him. In the case of Syria, I, we've learned our lesson. One option would be for the United States to try to overpower the various combatants, the Sunni rebel groups, the Shia rebel groups, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Hezbollah, they're all on the ground fighting, the Russian Air Force. That, does, that would be uh, historically uh, wrong, given what happened to us in Iraq. We got caught in Iraq with 150,000 troops. We were bled dry. We had to retreat. We shouldn't go back to that. Bob Gates, and I really respect him and worked for him in my career. When he left as Secretary of Defense in 2011, uh, another bipartisan person, he said the next Secretary of Defense who advises an American president to put a big American land army into the Middle East ought to have his head examined. And Bob Gates is somebody worth listening to. So I think the answer is President Obama, I think one of the great mistakes that he made as president, and I, I respect President Obama very much, but he drew a red line and told President Assad of Syria, don't cross this line. 
if you use chemical weapons, I'm going to hit back. And Assad used chemical weapons twice in 2013. And the cardinal sin of diplomacy is you got to mean what you say. If you threaten the power of the United States and someone answers back and there's no response, then people think you're a paper tiger. And President Obama thought that the, the risks were too high of any substantial American engagement, so there's a big vacuum of power. Putin filled it in 2015 when he put the Russian Air Force in. So the Russians have the advantage. They're aligned with the Iranians and the Syrian government. I don't think there's a military option for us beyond the American special forces who are there right now, several hundred of them according to the press. And they're really organizing the Syrian Kurds and some of the Syrian Sunni groups to fight the Islamic State, another objective. That's where we should be, using our air power, intelligence, and special forces to dislodge the Islamic State from northern Syria. And then I think we need to pivot towards diplomacy because we shouldn't go in militarily. We want to defeat the Russians in some ways, not see them win, not see Assad make 12 million homeless into 14 million homeless. So a big American diplomatic offensive to try to arrange a ceasefire, end the war, it's going to be messy, difficult compromises. But our humanitarian impulse has to be the strongest impulse. If you have 12 million homeless, that's got to be your greatest concern, end the war. A messy compromise where Assad survives, where he controls probably on a north-south axis the western part of the country along the Mediterranean Sea from Damascus in the south to Idlib province and Aleppo in the north, that's probably the compromise you're going to have to have, make. A messy, difficult compromise. That's what international politics sometimes is. We can't win here, but we can play a role towards diplomacy probably next year uh, after the Islamic State is dislodged from northern Syria. Where we would actually uh, activate the, the, uh, the, the comp in other words, getting all the parties together, we taking the, the most active role. I think the, the United States is the only country still with the political influence that could unite the Sunni Arab countries of the Gulf, and there's a schism between them this week, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and bring Turkey in. We're a pretty powerful force politically. If you could unite those countries, and Secretary Tillerson I think wants to do this, then you essentially go to the UN and you shame the Russians, Syrians, and Iranians into some kind of diplomatic set of negotiations where they're going to win a lot. But at least if we end the war, then you can set up refugee camps, humanitarian safe zones, get the food and medical supplies into 12 million homeless, 7 million inside the country, 5 million arrayed outside the country in refugee camps. That's got to be our greatest concern. There's no other society in the world where more than half the population have lost their homes and are at risk of, you know, there's 400,000 dead. These numbers are huge, and yet our national leaders aren't focusing us on this, focusing us on this problem. Thank you for your question. Yes, a mic's coming right behind you. Just the question on Iran a little bit. Uh, if you can reflect on we often hear that the demographics of Iran um, might work in our favor in terms of a younger um, society, yeah. a very intelligent society, educated. How does that square with the, the religious leadership and the political leadership, and how does that evolve potentially for us? And secondly, uh, your thoughts generally on the deal that was struck by the, uh, President Obama yeah. and the Iran deal overall. What a great question. Another, another issue where we could organize an entire course at BC or Harvard uh, on Iran. Well, first of all, I start from the premise that we all should. Iran is a great civilization of the Middle East. It's one of the great Middle Eastern civilizations of the last several thousand years. You can't contain it and wall it off and say it doesn't matter. There has to be some engagement, number one. Number two, I supported the Iran nuclear deal. I was President George W. Bush's Iran negotiator uh, for jo President Bush and Secretary Condi Rice. We didn't get to the negotiating table, so I ended up sanctioning, working with the Russians, Chinese, Europeans to sanction them in three Security Council resolutions. We began the private sector um, oil and gas embargo, private, the, the, the business sanctions. President Obama got them to the table. I thought it was a 55-45 deal. I could see the downsides of it, 45%, the risk. But 55%, most of it said to me, we get to freeze their nuclear program in place for 10 to 15 years. We don't have to fight a third major war in the Middle East. We have the Russians and Chinese inside the tent sanctioning them with us. And maybe 
what this does inside Iran is it tilts the balance towards that significant majority of Iranians who are entrepreneurial, business oriented, who want to trade and don't want to have their country to be the major problem child in the world. So I thought it was, I testified four times before Congress in 2015 in favor of the deal for that reason, but I saw the downsides. The problem we've got now, the Iranians have, is they're really divided. President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif are, in the Iranian context, reformers. They want to trade with the rest of the world. They don't want to be an international outlaw. They know they've created problems in the world. The Iranians are funding the Shia militants in Iraq. They're funding and arming Assad. They're on the ground with Assad. They're funding Hezbollah and they're funding Hamas. They're a major problem. So I agreed with the way that Secretary Clinton put it in the campaign. And I think the way President Trump sees it too. We need to contain Iranian power in the Middle East. That's why you need to have military relationships with Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Kuwait and Oman. And that's what President Trump did. I thought it was a largely successful trip that he had to the Middle East. The Europe trip, I thought, was an utter and complete disaster. But I think he's positioned us well here. And it's interesting. President Trump says that he opposes the nuclear deal but that's not the, poli the actual behavior of the Trump administration is to let the nuclear deal go forward. We have no other option now. If we walked out of the nuclear deal, then Iran wouldn't be subject to the sanctions or to the terms of the deal. And no other country would walk out with us. Britain wouldn't, France wouldn't, Germany wouldn't, and certainly not Russia and China. And we made the deal with those five, six countries. So um, I think we should just sail right ahead, hope that there's a change over time in Iran, where it's a more peaceful, outward-looking country, but be tough-minded in sanctioning them and blocking them on a conventional sense until they become a more peaceful citizen of the Middle East. That, I think that's the right strategy for the next 10 to 15 years. Yes, sir. Ambassador, you just mentioned, Ambassador, you just mentioned uh, Korea, uh, North Korea. Yes. What is your opinion about the idea of the Chinese rising to the occasion and helping us in this direction because this, uh, the, the leader there, he's just, I think he's just off the wall. I don't think the Chinese are gonna help us. But that doesn't mean that President Trump was wrong to try. Um, President Obama and President George W. Bush also appreciated the fact that China supplies most of the energy to North Korea, it supplies most of the food. It's the only country with a little bit of leverage but there's one problem in the theory that, well, China will then help us and solve the problem for us and you know, turn the screws and North Korea will back down from its nuclear weapons future. Here's the problem. The Chinese don't like Kim Jong-un. They know that he's a 33-year-old with no prior employment experience, <laughs> no prior management experience. The only, nobody in either party, any political leader has, in the United States has ever talked to him, the only significant American who's ever talked to him was a pretty good former basketball player. <laughs> but Dennis Rodman's probably not the guy. We want to negotiate the nuclear weapons future of North Korea. So, so the theory has been, if we don't have leverage or even contact, will China save us? And the answer is no, and here's why. China doesn't like Kim Jong-un. They don't like him threatening major Chinese trade partners, South Korea and Japan. But the Chinese fear something more than the status quo. They fear the dissolution of North Korea and the emergence of a united Korea, democratic, capital and soul aligned with the United States. With an American military ally right on the borders of China, they fear that more. The Chinese, and I've negotiated with them on North Korea. After the North Korean nuclear test of 2006, Secretary Rice sent me to Beijing and Seoul and Tokyo, had these conversations. We've had the same conversations since. They won't help us when push comes to shove. So then what is the answer? The answer is, like the Syria question, a really messy set of choices. There really is no military option for us. They have nuclear weapons. Since we don't know him, and he's so young, and he doesn't travel, and doesn't meet other global leaders, you can't be sure how he's going to react. If we decided, first of all, let's, let's say we're going to go in and take out the missile sites and bomb his nuclear facilities, unless you hit all of them, and have complete 100 success, if he's got anything left over, how can we be assured he won't launch a nuclear missile at Seoul, at Tokyo, or at the 25,000 American troops just south of the demilitarized zone? 
there are 14 million civilians living in greater Seoul. It would be catastrophic to make the bet. So there's nobody I know in the responsible part of the Republican or Democratic parties who believes that we can have, that there is a military option. If there's no military option, if China won't help us, President Obama thought, well, let's just freeze them out. We won't talk to them and we'll hope for the best. That didn't work very well. That failed. Secretary Tillerson's been saying, he's been musing publicly, but you know, people don't, don't just muse publicly. Maybe we should talk to the North Koreans. Maybe we should set up a China. Why should we have the Chinese be the middleman when we can't really trust the Chinese? It's like any business deal. You gotta trust the, someone who's working a deal with you. We can't trust the Chinese. I think we should establish contact with them, negotiate with them. The best we could do, sir, freeze them in place. They will not give up their nuclear weapons because they looked at Gaddafi. What happened to him when he gave up his nuclear weapons? They look at Saddam Hussein. He had chemical weapons. He gave them up. They're drawing conclusions. The best we can possibly achieve is some kind of messy freeze and then hope that he implodes, hope that the regime changes. But even in a regime change, that's a dangerous moment. How do you know the next guy isn't going to be worse than this guy? You don't know that. So we're so accustomed because we're so powerful. Let's resolve this. And I think in Syria and North Korea, we're heading towards very messy compromises, and that's probably the best thing we can and should do in a world where we can't get our way on these two. Last point. This is such an interesting question. The danger for us is that a lot of our experts think in three to five years, Kim Jong-un will have perfected an intercontinental ballistic missile, and he'll have miniaturized a nuclear warhead to fit on top of it, and that missile could successfully reach California, Oregon, Washington, maybe even the Rocky Mountain states. I would say that is an unacceptable threat. And that's where Secretary Tillerson is likely to start. He's a smart guy. He's likely to start with the Chinese and North Koreans by saying, if you intend to reach that point where you can hold the most successful and largest part of our economy hostage to terrorism, think twice. I think we should threaten them and we should try to encircle them militarily, as we have with our troops in South Korea and Japan. And we should tell the Chinese, if you're not willing to resolve this problem, it'll have a fundamentally negative impact on our relationship between Beijing and Washington. American president has never said that to the Chinese. Why shouldn't we put that on the agenda of U.S.-China relations? The idea that Kim Jong-un could fire a nuclear weapon at Los Angeles or San Francisco or Portland, Oregon, or Denver, Colorado, it's unacceptable. So a lot of people think it's the greatest problem we have in national security and will for the next five years. Steadiness, leadership, intelligence, it's a chessboard. We're taking the first moves. I think Secretary Tillerson's right to think this is probably the way to go. So I'm not here to say that Donald Trump is a disaster in every respect. <laughs> I think he's made some good opening moves on North Korea. I would have gone to the Chinese too, but it's not going to work, just as President Obama and George W. Bush found out it won't work. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, you talked about the isolationist tendency of President Trump. So my question is, do you think that there's a difference Yeah, that's a really good question. Is there a difference between outright isolationism and kind of the nationalist um, foreign policy that the president, Steve Bannon, and Steve Miller have talked about? I think there is. I mean, the president is not taking us back to some kind of singularly isolationist policy that Jefferson would have supported. You know, Jefferson didn't think we should compete in the world. He thought we should be a small agrarian society hugging the East Coast. Um, he's not taking us back there. But what's destructive about America First, as it's been practiced, is if the signal to Germany 
and to France, let's just pick those two countries, is I am seeing you, I, Donald Trump, mainly as an economic competitor. And I won't even say the words to acknowledge that we're strategic allies in NATO, as we've been since April 4th, 1949. Then we're in a whole different realm than we've been in for 70 years. The Republican orthodoxy of the last 70 years and the Democratic orthodoxy has been, of course we compete with the Europeans on trade. We take that for granted. We're the two largest economies in the world. But we are also strategic allies. We need the Europeans to contain Russia. We need the Europeans on climate. We need the Europeans to manage, manage the global economy. We need their investment. We need their trade. The President's message is, and read a Wall Street Journal op-ed by Gary Kahn and General McMaster in the wake of the President's trip, they said basically there is no global community. There are just competitive relationships, they use that word, and we intend to succeed one by one in competitive relationships. That turns American foreign policy on its head. It's not what Truman believed. It's not what Eisenhower believed. It's not what Reagan believed. It's not what Obama believed. We believe that the way Americans succeed is we form alliances and coalitions, we lead them, and we are out in the world. We don't withdraw into the continental United States and erect walls. And so what I see in America first is dangerously anti-modern, anti the economy and global politics as it's become in the 21st century. And I'd even say that I agree with David Brooks, who's a conservative person, writes the New York Times, we're seeing in the attacks on the judiciary by the president and on the press anti-enlightenment thinking. And that's dangerous in a democratic, enlightened society. I think the problems go all the way to that core. Yes? Nick, you didn't talk much about Islamic extremism, how that all plays out. Islamic extremism. It's, major, real risk it's a real risk in the Middle East. I mean, I talked about the fact that Al the Al-Qaeda groups have been defeated militarily by us in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they've metastasized into North, uh, the Horn of Africa, North Africa, and West Africa. So we're going to have to be contending with them. It's a real danger. I would say it's not an existential danger to the United States, however. They got through on 9-11. Disaster. But our Muslim population is patriotic, well-educated, family-oriented. They come in at, as families, mainly, as immigrants to the United States. They have not been a security problem, by and large, to the United States. A few isolated examples, San Bernardino, Bernardino being the most prominent. And um, if you start to make Muslim Americans think that they are the enemy and that they are the other and they're not really members of our society, it becomes, I think, I, I fear a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we've got to fight them militarily, economically, politically. This is an African and Arab battle. It's taking place in their societies. Our defenses are up appropriately here, but we actually are suffering compared to Britain, France, Germany, Iraq, Afghanistan. The threat isn't as nearly as profound for us. We have to help them, but it's their battle more than it's centrally our battle. And, and if we have an overreaction here, if we begin to su suppress civil liberties or have religious means tests, I'll let you come into the country if you're Christian or Hindu, but not if you're Muslim. That's fundamentally not who we are as a country, I think. Ambassador, we have time for one last question. I'm going to invoke moderator's privilege. Go ahead and ask it. But um, you started your comments talking about the risks of cyber and how the next war may start in the, in the cybersphere, but geographic considerations have dictated geopolitical boundaries for a long time. Mountains, rivers, oceans, we've been yeah. the beneficiary of that for a long time. Yes. Cyber creates asymmetrical risk, and we lose those benefits that we've had. Cyber attacks can come from anywhere and from small players. How do you think about that? How do we mitigate that? What do we do? Yeah, one of the single biggest challenges we face is your question. And uh, just a couple concluding thoughts very briefly. Number one, you do have to raise your defenses uh, if um, you've got an assault on your economy on people's laptops being invaded by these, you know, the creation of these botnets, millions of bits of information being stolen, put in the black market. 
So the government has largely been ahead of the private sector, especially the military, in raising the defenses. Uh, the private sector needs to raise its defenses, and we need to have best practices um, be learned in every corporate boardroom and every part of our civil society and every part of our government. We know the Russians, for instance, hacked us. We know it was more than just fake news. We know they tried to get inside electronic voting machines. We know that from the leaks just over the last couple of days. So we've got to raise our defenses. Then we have to go on offense. And we have a very adept intelligence community. This is not going to be a battle fought by soldiers. It's going to be fought by geeks. President Obama said, to, he, went to, he said in 2015, we want to hire several thousand geeks. We won't make you cut your hair. You can wear jeans to the office. You sit at a computer terminal, but you're going to be warriors in the cyber battles. So you need to do that. Go on offense. Third, you need rules of the road to unite the democratic law-abiding countries of the world in common purpose. Here's what we believe about cyber. Here's what, how we'll behave. Then you need to go to two people, Putin and Xi Jinping, and say, OK, maybe your government agencies are not doing this. Maybe it's some hacker in Sverdlovsk or Shanghai. But we don't really care where the attacks come from on our private and public sector. If they continue, we're going to hit back against you guys. And then try to have some kind of agreement with both of those governments. They're the leading source of cyber attacks in the world against our critical facilities of trying to depress the competition between us and regulate it. That's what we've been doing with warfare for several thousand years. How do you regulate and minimize the chance of destruction? So cyber is no different than trying to regulate chemical weapons or biological weapons or nuclear weapons. It's a big challenge for us. Well, Ambassador, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.